Welcome to File Exchange, a channel dedicated to elevating the voices of artists, writers, and curators who have a focus on art made with 3D software. This channel allows you to be a fly on the wall as we share philosophies, tools, and tips revolving around these 21st century tools. I am Colette Robbins, and that is my co-host, Sophie Kahn. And as hybrid digital analog sculptors, we're always excited to pop open the hood and see what files are behind the work of our guests. And this week's guest is the fabulous Riddell Warner. Uh, and Riddell Warner is a Trinidadian artist working primarily in new media and photography. And most recently his works have been exhibited at the Art Gallery of Ontario in the 2021 exhibition Fragments of Epic Memory and at Turn Gallery in Nassau in the Bahamas in 2021, uh, a solo exhibition Augmented Archives. Riddell lives and works between Port of Spain and Trinidad, Kingston and Jamaica, and Austin, Texas in the US. And I met Riddell in the Tezos community. That's how we found each other. Mm -hmm. And I was very drawn in by his work and uh, this Terraria series he has, and, and we connected via that NFT space. And I am so excited to introduce Riddell Warner, and we'd love to hear a little bit about kind of where your work comes from and kind of how you got into digital tools. So welcome. Yeah, welcome. Excellent. Thanks, Sophie. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me to do this. Thank you. Um, so I got into digital work um, kind of, I was actually really into when I was um, like around 19, I was really into um, uh, clothes, like into, um, printing on t-shirts, like making my own prints, because I couldn't find clothes that I wanted to wear that felt um, branded in ways that I liked. So I would make stencils, cut stencils out of acetate and then roll, roll paint onto t-shirts. And there was this whole like online community who it was kind of adjacent to like graffiti. And so like this like online graffiti, online graffiti people would share all the tips and tricks for making like two layer stencils and three layer stencils and all that. And I would, I was into that because I wanted to, to make prints on t-shirts and to make my prints, I would, I would, I would use lots of stock photos. Um, and eventually I wanted to stop spending money on stock photos because it was kind of expensive. So I got a camera and fell in love with photography. So um, that's how I started kind of working with digital files. And um, uh, yeah, so I, so I started using Photoshop and manipulating images. And then, um, you know, you know, to do text and stuff, I started using Illustrator and, and with me vectors. And um, through just knowing how to do those things, I got a job at a local printery in Port of Spain in Trinidad, where I lived. Um, and then from that, somebody suggested that I would go to work at this like um, ad agency. I went to this ad agency where there was a studio full of artists, um, like twenty different artists doing you know, choreographers and writers and all kinds of things. And that's where I really started. Um, having an art career because I started um, making work and showing um, with those people and learned a lot from them and um, really started spending a lot of time online at that point because my um, manager, the, the artist that ran the studio would give us like points at the at our end of year kind of um, assessment if we like shared interesting links with the rest of the team. So I spent lots of time online and it was just kind of really free environment. Um, and it's the first time I had kind of like unrestricted internet access in my life. So I was just online on Tumblr the whole time. This is like 2008, 2009. And um, I used to run a blog um, called Too Much Eyes on Tumblr that I just cataloged lots of images, photos from Twitter. Do you still have that? Do you still it have still exists. Yeah, I haven't, I, you know, the other day I tried to kind of revive it, but I realized I'm just not there anymore. Like, I'm not going to spend all my time, like, like looking up. Can I'll you share it? Like, can we see yeah, this I can, little? Yeah, I can, can show you. you? Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> that is so interesting that you came from, I'm really liking hearing this background about, like, the online experience you had in that community-oriented, like, aspect of the online community. Um, and, and that that's okay. Do you mind if um, I share it on the screen? Would you no, mind? Would you? No, not at all. 
Um, let me. You want to share it? No, um, I just realized the link I sent you, I don't know if it worked well. Um, so I was going to try and like oh, look, no. look it up in the yeah. browser and then, and then just copy the whole. Um... Right. Too much eyes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I was on That's Tumblr back in the day. I'm not sure. I oh, you were. My Tumblr is still active though. Oh yeah. It it might be at you know they don't shut them down. <laughs> yeah, maybe like, I just they're also there. It. The yeah. internet never forgets, right? It's still out there. Yeah, and um, on so on too much eyes. I would basically be downloading, like sharing. I would, I would just Google. I would just look online for archives of photos of Trinidad because um, a, a few of the artists. That were older than me in the studio that they were really in, interested in like um you know what's the local aesthetic what 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 can we use in our work what can we talk about or like using the things that we make that are, are from this place and not kind of like just um cultures yeah. from other places yeah. and so yeah. and so looking up like trying to like find the history of trinidad online was kind of what i was into at the time um and i've got it for everybody yeah, so, out there so they can see what yeah yeah so the first maybe like 10 or so posts are maybe more recent but but beyond that um the, the, they're all what i would have been um sharing on tumblr from like 2008 to maybe like 2012 mm -hmm. um also i think the, the, the this page might be broken if you get to the bottom and you can't it doesn't automatically load you can do slash page slash page two and it loads page two or slash page 22 and it loads page, page 22. Yeah. Um, but these are all pictures of Trinidad, um, lots of, uh, from, from decades past. Mm -hmm. And it was really just this kind of way of kind of um, locating myself mm. in the history of the place. Like I had never been around people that kind of cared about it or talked about it in this way. You know, and at this time, you know, I'd only spent time in like high school and I worked, I worked a few like different jobs for the last for like a couple of years and then I found myself in the studio around all these artists who cared about all these things that I'd never been around people who cared about these things before so um, my kind of sense of history in the place my sense of self was yeah. really what I was interested in and this this blog really resonated a lot with people who um who have Caribbean or Trinidadian parents but they themselves were born in like the states or in the UK or something or Canada oh, um yes yeah. so one history Yes, yeah, and they and they're I just you know sometimes some of them like around my age we're all on Tumblr and they're interested in the same thing like going through the same exercise of kind of like trying to locate themselves in yeah. this, and then um, one of them in particular an an artist and curator called Ria McNamara and she um, lives and at the time also lived in Toronto, um, she was she she was on Tumblr as well and she was one of, like one of the main people who'd be reblogging my things and. Kind of interested in the same things I'm interested in, and um, she started a series of art parties in Toronto called Shiro's. And Shiro's, there were twelve of them, one every month, and for a whole year, there was this this party once a month. And what they would do is like celebrate uh, a Shiro, like a kind of uh, female cultural hero. Um, so I got on like on number number ten or number nine, I think it was Grace Jones, and um, and I used to I used to make um, I used to make gifts at this point too. Like I'd started at this point, like my photography, I kind of like started experimenting with animation a little bit, or like abstracting my images. Right. And I had another I had another blog, another Tumblr that I was kind of sharing those things on. I'll I'll um, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you that one. That one was called oh, yeah. uh, Mystery Cycle. Yeah, please send us that one too. Yeah, this is like the history of your experience with like internet culture as yeah. well and connecting yeah. with artists through internet culture as opposed to traditional art world structures or academia like this is this is really interesting. Yeah, yeah totally. And and you know I I I didn't go to art school. I got into art school in Trinidad in at the University of Westinies, but I chose not to go because the, the part-time option that they had there. I, I would have had to work and go to school at the same time and their part-time option didn't allow me to to actually keep a job because it was so the, the schedule was so all over the place so mm -hmm. I had to choose and, and I had a, I had this I had this job <laughs> oh yeah this one um it takes some time to load sometimes because I have all these it runs all these gifts um oh, these are great I love these it's beautiful um, yeah thanks. this is, I love the this grain is like, it. like that digital grain oh I was yes. so into it yeah I was so into it when you when you get photoshop to export like a black and white gif and and it, oh. and, it and it just it breaks it just did us everything I was so into that dithering yeah um 
Yes, he's beautiful. And, um, yeah, and Rhea basically invited me, she and Lorna Mill. So every time they had this party, they would get like the people from different like niches and subcultures to contribute work to the party. So they got like the house of, I forget the name of the house, like these like, uh, this like a crew of drag queens to perform at every event. And they would like all be in costume as like, um, as the Shiro of that month. And oh, they got like, amazing. yes, oh, and those artists. I come to those parties. That sounds so fun. Oh, yeah, I'm so really fun. jealous. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> it was even fun for me. And I wasn't even there in, in, like in person. Like me, yeah. the group I was in was like, they got all these internet artists, all these people who make gifts and stuff to kind of to also contribute. There were all these different like niches of artists. And so they had the drag queens doing their costuming and stuff. They had like these artists making macrame, they had singers, and then they had these like, um, artists making internet like internet art and yeah. Lorna Mills Lorna Mills was a curator for that and so um, through Rhea and Lorna that's how I met like a whole bunch of amazing um, internet artists and people just who were making gifts and stuff and yeah. for, for that year and then like even years after that we would all it, it became this kind of informal collective uh, and every time somebody was having an event they would just kind of like send a group email to the collective and we'd all just make oh, gifts for each other's shows that. and stuff like that Awesome. Yeah. And these were in Toronto. You said the parties were in Toronto, right? Yeah. 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 Um, oh, that is so. Cool. Oh, and I could I could actually send you. So the way that the way that um that that um Lauren and Rhea documented Shiro's was also on Tumblr. So um, I'm gonna send you the Shiro's um Tumblr yeah. so you can see what I look like. Um, I'm not they, in. I'm not in the Tumblr. I don't have a Tumblr account. <laughs> oh. I, I this is dust mine off now. I'm, <laughs> I'm inspired. Yeah. I now I'm like I'm having like Tumblr shame, like that I don't have a. <laughs> uh -huh. You're on Pinterest though, right? Like Colette has an amazing. Yeah, I'm a I'm a Pinterest. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Like thousands. This is neat. Yeah, it's a great way to organize organize images. I just kind of love. I mean, yeah, they're all just ways for like people who kind of hoard images to kind of organize themselves and and, and yeah, share with other people yeah. i think it's really neat. share it exactly you know yeah. really i i think you see a whole other side of how somebody's brain works when you see yeah. what they've sort of collected visually you yeah, know like absolutely. the connections between each thing it's it's really invaluable to see that this is amazing this is a yeah, whole world that I didn't know anything about and I'm so excited to learn about it. And I'm so glad that everybody else can watch this too. Yeah, oh, yeah this, this, this was important for me because I, like, I don't know, like the, just the, just the amount of like abstraction and weirdness that these artists were into. Mm -hmm. I just got exposed to so much. Like it was, yes. it was mind blowing every time. And, you know, some of my favorite artists um, like Francis Gamble, for example, would make work for the show. And so, first of all to be in a group that's like with this person and all these people have to Andrew Benson was in this group mm -hmm. um yeah. uh so many and Lorna Mills was in this group and like every to, to, to do this thing every month we're like I'm making with, with these people we all kind of have the same theme in mind or whatever um and to see what they're doing like how they interpret the thing it was just like yeah. really expensive so I didn't go to art school but like experiences like this where I'm like interacting yeah, with like really that amazing education and yeah. now you're not in a ridiculous amount of debt and you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and and so like um so so this is how I got really got into kind of like um messing with images to the degree that like yeah um I'm really doing my own thing with them or like uh I'm I'm really you know the thing that what I, what I really think of as an artist practice is like you know when you when you when you do something enough that like all of the all, all of the refinement that comes from your the particular way that you do it um, has resulted now in you being the only person that does this thing. And if anybody wanted to come along and like do this thing, they'd have to kind of, they'd have to learn all these little things that you learn over all the hundreds of hours that you uh, spent tinkering. This is what we talk about the process. a lot, actually. I feel like this is a topic that's come up sort of repeatedly on file exchange with a lot of our guests is every little step and decision that leads to the evolution of an aesthetic and yeah, I mean, I, I, we've talked about it too, Colette, before, like somebody maybe could come along and try to kind of make work like in my style. I don't know that they'd have the patience for it right. <laughs> because of like, you know, but yeah, all, all of these, this kind of this accumulation of like knowledge, research, aesthetic decision, aesthetic response, and your environment and your community, all kind of this 
big pot where it all kind of melts down and yeah 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 Yeah. no that's this is great thank you for this this introduction to your aesthetic like I love hearing Mm -hmm. this is fun um so um so what I'm doing now um is um is kind of Oh, so uh, like around 2017, I was really inspired by this artist called Pastelli, and Pastelli started minting with on um, on Tezos last year too, and mm-hmm. and and at the time Pastelli was on Instagram and still is and has a huge following on Instagram, um, and Pastelli, uh, she's from Sweden and she does these 3D um, 3D models, 3D characters like like and, and it's it's very figurative, mm-hmm. and at the time I was just so struck by the um, complexity and um, like detail of, I don't know, it was just at the time, like all these artists I was, I was into and really inspired by and the stuff that I was doing was never really figurative. Um, and so it was kind of, I was really jealous is what it was. And mm-hmm. you know, when you get really jealous, um, well, you know, it lets you know, that's what, that's something I'm probably it's interested motivating. in doing. It's, it's yeah. a motivator. It gives you some energy. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. So after, after like um, falling over Pastelli for the longest time, I was like, I think I need to learn 3D modeling. And mm-hmm. I kind of went, tried to um you know I was like you know did a little bit of research I, I found out about Blender and I found Blender really difficult in the first place to get into like I would watch tutorials and stuff and it I become so discouraged <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was so hard yeah. I'm so um, excited it yeah um I um I the only like when I actually got over the hump when I actually like there was a moment a one a one week period from which I went at the beginning to being like I think I could kind of tinker around with this for a long time and maybe figure it out to okay I'm literate with Blender I know I, I can do things now it was one week that I actually um got trapped I, I went to um I went to Berlin but my, my flight back to Trinidad was from Frankfurt and I I, I don't know about like, trains in Europe I took the wrong something. I ended up late yeah. to the airport. I got trapped. I am yeah. out of money and I end up spending the week in a hostel. There's only one more flight. It's the next week. It's one <laughs> flight a week. So I have to wait a whole week. Yeah. That was like yeah. Blender Bootcamp. That was like Blender Bootcamp. Yeah. Because like I left the I left the room twice for the day to get food. But other than that, you know, I just didn't want to get any trouble. I didn't have any money. I was just like, I'm gonna live in Blender. That's so amazing. Just, like, that's yeah, probably fresh, like on a residency away from my children, like away from my housework and my children, two weeks in a room, me and ZBrush. And it was like, you know, two men enter, one man leaves. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I've been there. No, it's, it's, that's so funny. Can you uh, share an image from that time frame, like where you first started getting into 3D? Yeah. Um, you know, I was looking for it and I was, I was, I was, I had such a hard time finding it. Um, so I'm going to try and search again. Um, I ended up, while I was looking for it, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to show any old stuff. I'm just going to show what I'm interested in now. Oh, but I'm yeah. Not, Oh yeah, remote, that's fine. Whatever. Like, you- me. Let me just, let me just, let me just try one more time. I don't, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm like, why can't I find this, okay. these files? Oh, I know how that is. Yeah, we know. And I, I feel like the best way for me to learn software is to have to teach it. <laughs> yeah because when, like, talk about like a cattle prod behind you <laughs> it's a it's a really good way to push myself like further and further with the softwares when it's when I'm teaching it just like that's yeah. my boot camp Rachel, while you're looking like I yeah. so many people that we've had this conversation with in 3D were self-taught. And I mean, Mm -hmm. I did go to art school, but I learned in the time between undergrad and grad school, you know, and it was like YouTube and sort of hitting my head against a wall for three days trying to solve things. It's almost everybody I know in the industry actually is self-taught. Our education was the internet, which is like a really, really interesting. It's an interesting moment in time for artists because like all of a sudden, I mean, uh, the trade secrets of artists, so to speak, are all out, you know, to learn. Like, um, whereas before you'd have to like get in with an artist and be able to like get a private conversation with them. Mm -hmm. And now you can just, if you want to learn 3D modeling, you can learn 3D modeling and Blender's free. And like, as long as you have a Wi-Fi connection. And I think that's, um, and I think also what you were talking about with internet culture and the culture of sharing work and kind of having collectives, loose collectives in that context and like sharing that in this whole world of Tumblr and artists on Tumblr, which is, it's newer for me. Um, 
coming from a traditional painting um, background and then kind of getting into technology like through the through a back door, so to speak, <laughs> through ZBrush, which is like the most insane first piece of 3D software to, to jump stuff. into. I can't believe you started there. <laughs> like it's all it's all downhill. Like everything else is easier after that, you know. Yeah, um, I just ZBrush makes sense to me. It's the only one that really makes sense to me, which is yeah. even more than Photoshop. Photoshop, every I don't like things where it's like too linear. I like all the remeshing and like I like how it's it thinks like um, my subconscious. Yeah, I think I, think I, I definitely downloaded ZBrush one time. It was years ago. I think I opened the interface and saw so many buttons. I was like, uh, I think it's kind of second out. and I never got into it. But be, but when I saw, I saw I just saw you with Clip for the first time, like like two or three weekends ago. I, I ran and came came across your Instagram, and I at first I didn't know it was digital. I thought it was the, the textures were so natural looking that I thought it was clear that you was like handling with your hands. And mm -hmm. I was like, I need to I need to follow this sculptor because I need these images in my life. And oh. um, and then we got to talking, and and I learned that you oh actually I scrolled more I scrolled down more and I realized yeah. oh my god these are digital files and this these are three D prints, and when I got when I when I understood that you were able to get all these textures and stuff, um using three D print using like like digitally and then you told me that you're using ZBrush I was like okay I need to learn ZBrush oh so, yeah we are our like DMs are open uh, you like yeah 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 we're happy to troubleshoot ZBrush stuff. Yeah, always happy to help. Yeah. Like I'm so I'm always so excited when an artist starts using ZBrush because I mean, even like Sophie wasn't using it that much before your boot camp residency. And then it, you know, it just it opens up a whole new can of worms. Hmm. Yeah, which is really fun. And I think it'll be interesting to see some of your organic textures. I, I'm sure you're gonna hit some things where it uses a different part of the brain to think about the files, which is, I think, can be confusing at first because it's thinking about remeshing as opposed to thinking about individual polygons, like building them up, you know. Um, mm. Yeah. So I'm excited, okay. to, but I don't think I've seen some of your early 3D stuff. So I'm excited. Well, if you okay, so I found something. I found, so what I was looking for Beautiful. was the very first file that I, um, that, I, that, I, that I worked on, the one I worked on in that hotel, in that hostel room in, in, in Frankfurt, but I couldn't find it. Um, and that one was, um, it was, so the tutorial I was using to learn um, Blender was this tutorial for shaping a human head. And it's this YouTube tutorial and they give you these two files, uh, a woman's face from the front and also the side profile. And you load these two files into Blender, and then they teach you in the tutorial how to like add shapes and manipulate them so that you end up with this head. So I did that tutorial, but instead of using the 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 woman's face that they recommended in the tutorial, I just shot my own face, my own head, front and side. And so my first Blender project was to make this replica of my head, and it was okay. I, um, you know, I was really happy with it until um, I started showing it to people, and they started pointing out all of the things that. You know, all the ways really look like me. Yeah. So I it also took me months to do. Um, but then I I redid it because I wanted to, I was so interested in using this model in my work, but I couldn't have people telling me that my ears look funny and that kind of thing. So I had to redo it. <laughs> so what I found is um is the version that I made in 2019, which is two years later when I redid my oh. and I just got better at um I just got better at like drawing shapes more um more true to what i what i need them to be and not like having to compromise less because i can't make the moves or i can't i mm -hmm. can't pull the mesh in the ways that it needs to, to look natural i just got better at manipulating the points to make the curves that i need so it's like i got better at drawing in the in this space mm -hmm. um i accidentally pressed tab to go into edit mode while having the hair selected so my computer's kind of freaking out right now <laughs> yeah no, it's no, that's so cool to see the beginning of that. And to, like, yeah. now I'm really excited to see, well, what was the next step? What kind of led you to the work you're doing now? Well, so what I was interested in was, um, so Pastelli, who's the artist from Sweden that, um, that I was inspired by to make 3D models. Um, what I really wanted to do, my real motivation, and I was into photography and I was, I was very much into, um, setting up photo shoots, like calling people, getting people together and kind of making, mm -hmm. making, making images, making compositions. Yeah. Um, but at this time I had become kind of antisocial, like, um, 
I wasn't interested so much in getting people together anymore. And I, but I was interested in depicting intimacy. And I, and I thought mm-hmm. I was inspired by Pastelli's work. And I thought if I can make 3D models of myself and my friends, then maybe I can make um, photographic like um, compositions that um, that depict intimacy. And maybe it would even be possible to, to make compositions, to make photos, photo like images that were more intimate than um, that we would be able to, to do in real life or we'll be willing to do in real life. So, um, so I was really interested in doing something figurative. So let me, um, what, what I actually came to, I feel like the most re, 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 re Sorry, I just lost the word I'm looking for. Um, okay. Refined. It's all <laughs> refined. Yeah. yeah. When you got refined in Blender, no, it's, uh, I, no, I understand. Um, when I got, yeah, so I, around 2020, which is, I guess, a year after the, the file I just showed you, I started making um, a set of tarot cards. Um, mm-hmm. I had just moved was from it, the Caribbean. That was the first work of yours that I saw. Yeah. Yeah, those are beautiful. Thank you. Wait, can, and, um, can you share that on your site while we're talking yeah, about it I'm, so I'm everybody gonna, can see? On my site, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I know sometimes it's hard to share blend files because they get a little cranky. Yeah. With computers when you're on Zoom and it's being recorded. Oh, yeah. I, I cleared my desktop today and like restarted. Beautiful. It. <laughs> it's like <laughs> a way of like, cleaning your house. It's yeah. now clearing your desktop. Totally. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna share this link now. Um, nice. But now that I'm screen sharing, I've lost with a little chat button. Let me see if I can find it back. I think when you're sharing, mm-hmm. it's like up the top and there's a little arrow. Hmm. Also, if you just, let's I'm gonna see, s- I'm gonna, yeah, stop oh, the share, oh, okay, then yeah. you'll see it. Yeah, no you can also just share it on your screen. You can just open it up and. Okay. I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share my whole screen, just my, my whole desktop Perfect. instead of just Blender. Beautiful. Okay. So um, I'm gonna open one of these files. <clears throat> yeah, and so he, I was telling, I was telling Nicole, my wife, um, I was telling her what one of the things I like about your um, your work is that it uses images of the body and like scans of the body, but there's this, um, I feel often with um, digital work, there's, and where, where the body is used, mm. often you get that uncanny valley, you, you end up in that uncanny valley space where like, it's like almost human, but not, not quite human enough. And so you feel like you're looking yeah. at mannequins or something that's kind of lifeless and that kind of, that, that, that totally like, you know, makes your ability to suspend this belief go away. Yeah. And, um, and it's really distracting, I think, when looking at 3D works that use uh, 3D models of the body. But with your work, um, there's this like very um, real t- like feeling about it. And so it, it feels visceral. Yeah, and- I think the scanner helps. Helps with well, that. the scanner really creates yeah. like a almost like a realistic gesture. Yeah, yeah, which is really kind of unique to that tool, mm-hmm. and then unique to when you print it like that, it breathes. It's like so the body you still have this feeling of realness, but it's kind of gestural in its like fragmented shapes. Yeah, there are mm. little pieces that you see, things like, you know, I was just working on one today where it has like the tendons in the model's hand and the fingers mm. are smooth off, but you can still see the way the light comes over the tendons. And it's, yeah, it's a level of um, sort of realism to the anatomy that I definitely could not sculpt. Like I couldn't sculpt a head. I don't do figurative sculpting at all. Oh, oh beautiful. See this. Because I know yeah. this image, but yeah, to see it behind the scenes is great. Oh, that's so fun. Ah, and so you rig these as well, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's the only thing I've ever rigged. And, um, you know, I also did this by, um, I use a, a tutorial, a rigging tutorial. And, um, well, 
it, it, it did the job, but it's not the best rigging. So I, so these characters are actually quite limited in what I can do with them, like how I can actually pose them, because if I bend the knees past a certain degree, the, the mesh warps in such a way that it doesn't look right. Um, so that's one limitation. A whole other skill set. I never taught it or learned it. And it's like in a studio, there'll be somebody who only does rigging. They don't model, they don't render. They don't so it's like, it's a whole other thing. But um, yeah, I like the pose here, like the gravity, the kind of falling of that. Feel, that feels really natural. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was really pleased with this one. Mm. And, 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 and so also, also um, the way I generated the body, um, I didn't sculpt the whole body. I used, um, there's, a, there's a thing that generates, what's the name of it? There's a, there's a, there's a tool that generates, um, generates bodies mm. and, I, and so I generated a body with kind of similar height and waist as mine. And then I, I, I like, I rendered the mesh in such a way that it, I could edit the points. And then I put, I put reference photos of myself in front and side, just like the head. And I just tweaked all of the dimensions so that it fit my, my body. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have to generate a body from scratch. Um, I did have to, I did have to model genitals because the model didn't create those. So that was, Oh, that's it. That's like what I had to do from scratch. Just <laughs> yeah, it just as mannequin type thing. It's like Barbie. It's Barbie. Right, like Barbie. Yeah. Um, and then the and then the the hair. So I'm really also very pleased with the hair on this model and also on the model I did of, of Nicole because I modeled her as well. Mm -hmm. Um, because the to figure out how to get the cool pattern was so tricky. I had to find the right balance of all these different um, like aspects. Um, and ended up getting getting something that could actually that that actually worked um, or felt close enough to real life. Seems like a blind spot in the software, doesn't it? That it can't generate yeah. a range of hair textures. Like I think that's really you know interesting to think about. Like who designed that software and what are they thinking about when they're like whose hair are they thinking about when they're building it? You know. Yeah, I I, I also wasn't ever able to replicate this. So so every time I need to do hair, I just refer to this file or I've duplicated it. Put, I've put this in a bunch of different files because if I had to, if I had to figure it out all over again, I'm not sure I could. Mm -hmm. I was just really lucky to have to have tweaked everything in, in the right way to for it to actually produce these curls. But um, other than like, you know, if I had to do it over, I'm not sure I could actually do it over. So I'm I'm happy that I have these files like saved and backed up. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a blind spot in the software. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's beautiful. But when I, I should I should actually show you the um the the hermit because um because the hermit has a plant in it and so oh I should I should actually also show you um oh, I when, love it um Nicole file exchange folder this yeah is so <laughs> um let me see where is the, what, oh this is what I'm looking for So um, around the time I was doing this week, Nicole and I got engaged and uh, had to quickly put together a, a, an invitation to a wedding. Yeah. And I had just finished the model of her and, she, and we were really happy with it. And so I used these two models in, um, in this uh, engagement announcement, wedding invitation. So I'm gonna- Engagement announcement. I love that. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so romantic. Ooh. Oh, that's beautiful. So um, I'm trying to show you what the rendered vision looks like. And um, and I was really interested in how using the plants um, allowed me to cover up the um, imperfections in my model <laughs> and also kind of create um, a space. I don't know why it's... Um... It might be a little tough with yeah. the recording and the connection, but it's coming. Yes, it's coming. Um, so, so the plans allowed me to cover up sort of areas that where the limbs weren't bending well enough and things like that. But I also really liked what happened the way they, the way it created space, the way it, the way it turned what was just open empty space into something more intimate. And um, oh, that's I actually, cool. yeah, I actually um, thanks. I I had been really interested in plants throughout the all of my whole. Um, sort of career as an artist and and it really started off back with the same group of artists in 
at the ad agency, so we had in two, from 2000, like 2008, 2011. And um, two, two, two artists in particular, um, uh, two bit had become mentors to me, um, a dancer and choreographer called Dave Williams, and also um, an architect who used to work nearby, who was friends with Dave Williams, his name is Sean Leonard. And I would like go and hang out with them and they would be talking about, you know, what makes Trinidadian aesthetics. And they got to talking about all the bush, all the, all the kind of like yeah. plants and flora that just grows everywhere that we spend so much time cutting and weed whacking and, and mowing and getting rid of. And if you want to take a picture, you don't want to stand in front of the bush, you want to like get out. You don't, you don't, that's not what you want in your background because what makes us, you know, what in pop, top, dominant culture, popular culture, is makes makes cool aesthetics is definitely not at that time at least wasn't being set up in front of bush that, that kind of communicated maybe like um being rural um so they were kind of like let's glorify that stuff let's talk let's take what just grows here and instead of make feeling bad about it let's like let's make stuff with it so right. I had, they're trying to like beat it into submission you know yes and yes then negate it yeah yeah so i had i had done i'd Made, made lots of photos where they, they were just shot in the forest or on the side of the road where this bush in the background I had made zines where I had made take, taken photos of bush just all the and it, and it really has a lot to do with like the way the plants grow and, and tangle into each other and entwine and all of that and all the aesthetics of like just being overgrown um and and so that that made its way into this image here where they kind of grow through our bodies and stuff mm -hmm. um and and it really made me, that whole practice just really made me fall in love with plants. And I'd always loved plants, even when I used to draw, because I used to I used to draw a lot. And it was always, I always loved drawing plants. So when I started making 3D models and, start, and, and realized that I wanted to make some plant matter to kind of use in my compositions, I actually fell in love with the plants themselves. And I have since made many, many more models of plants than I have of human beings. I actually hadn't mo haven't modeled any human beings after these two models of Nicole and myself. But I've made many, many models of plants. Yeah. Yeah. So that was um, your last kind of figurative. Yeah. Um, I did use these figures in other um other compositions. So like the tarot cards. So let me show you the helmet, um, which has a plant in it as well. That's so interesting too. That's a really beautiful analogy when thinking about, because I'm a big gardener, as you know, we talked a little bit about that last time we met. Um, yeah. And I, you know, deciding which weeds to remove and which weeds to let breathe is like a big yeah. part of what I'm trying to do within this shared garden, because I, you know, I want to be mindful of the ecosystem there. But it's kind of a beautiful analogy, like letting nature breathe and even the weeds and some of the, you know, the bits that aren't as quite, you know, manicured or groomed and letting them get center stage um, yeah. in an interesting way. So I think it's, that's a, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, even thinking about like how the, how the plants that are kind of acceptable and cool, how they got to be acceptable and cool oh, yeah. just from, from people making decisions about you know, I am going to include this. I'm going to frame this up, and and we are those people who make who are making these images of plants and who are choosing so we can shape um, what's um, cool, what's acceptable, what's what we want to show or see um, by making conscious choices about it. Definitely, I mean, and and that kind of evolution of our relationship with the plants we choose, just like. Mm -hmm you know, the animals we've chosen to eat as humans and, you know, all of those things, how we evolve mm -hmm. together and what happens when we make those choices over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, the plant in this one is a plant um, that is in Trinidad is called um, Wonder of the World. In Jamaica is called the Leaf of Life. Um, I think it's also called in the States the Mother of Thousands. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. there's another... Yeah, and, and and this is one variety of it, and there, there are few, quite a few varieties, but this one, what, what kind of characterizes these plants is that you can, when the leaves fall, the new plants grow from the leaves, or in some in some instances, the little plantlets grow along the edges of the leaf, and then they fall, so like little, it's, it's, the, the plant is fractal in that it produces small versions of itself on itself, and then they fall off and grow into new plants. Um, and the plant is considered to have uh, medical uh, benefits. So um, mm -hmm. people brew tea out of it and drink it when they have colds and stuff like that. Um, and, and this plant, um, you know, it, it's well known in Trinidad. 
and also in Jamaica. And so, um, uh, and, and I love looking at it. And it's, it's actually really fascinating to look at. The one I model doesn't have any little plantlets on it, but when you see it in real life and all of the edges of all these leaves are studded with tiny fractal clones of the plant, it's just really stunning. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was modeling the hermit and kind of reading all about the, um, all the kind of the details or the characteristics of the archetype of the hermit, um, it seemed to make sense to put this in there. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. I mean, I just, I love the, the smoking too. And like, yeah. the yeah. and just the and kind of, again, the romantic yeah. pose and relationship between the human and the plant and like the, the negative space you're using for your render and just thinking about the symbolism and then also just the romanticism. I just, I keep, that word keeps coming up with your work. And now no, that, that, that's a great, I, I hadn't thought of it, and but totally, that's totally what it is because, you know, and, and I also like when I'm doing this, it's a self-portrait and so I'm thinking of myself um, in this context and like how I would be if I were, if I, if I were the human thing, you think of the human, you think a lot of like the shaman or like the medicine man. Also the human mm. is sort of as like an older version of the magician. So you think of this person in his younger life as kind of being this person who makes something out of nothing all the time or does these miraculous things. But now it's like older and wiser and quieter maybe. And all of this goes into it. Now, I was really interested in, in communicating intimacy with these um, with these these compositions, these portraits. And I really feel like this one, I got I got something in this one of that. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, this one's beautiful. Well, even the like, if you've carried around those pots, like yeah. like kind of that feeling of the pot next to your skin and like yeah. that, that touch that yeah. you're bringing up, which I think is like something we've talked about a little bit too, it's just that idea of like, how do you create the feeling of touch or like you were saying, intimacy with these digital tools, which are seemingly so distant or removed, which I don't agree with because I feel like the hand is so much in what you're doing here. And um, yeah. the hand in technology, I think is a really interesting subject too, that's coming up with your work. Mm. Um, but so this is what led into the Terraria series. Is that yeah. how and like led you into getting into Tezos and minting and like? Yes. Um, so this these these tarot cards I was making in 2020, and this was you know at the time I was also making um, at the time I was also working in a mushroom farm. Um, so in Trinidad I worked in advertising. I freelanced. But because I didn't go to art school, all of my relationships are informal. These are just like personal relationships that are also professional relationships. So when I when I when we moved to the States, it was um, studying here in Austin, Texas. Um, none of my like relationships translated and I couldn't work in the way I did in Trinidad. So I started working at a friend's mushroom farm, um, which was also very cool. Um, yeah. and and at night I would kind of make art when I when I, when I came home and yeah. um, and so what I was working on was these tarot cards. And um, so that's 2020. And that's right around the time that like, COVID started becoming a big thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I wasn't, but also people really love these cards and the, the tarot cards. And I, I wasn't, while it was the thing I was working on, I wasn't sure I wanted to mint them because I wasn't sure yet what NFTs, how they would really I wasn't sure how to really engage NFTs exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I wasn't sure if, you know, I, I, I remember, um, you know, I started following and paying attention to lots of people who were into it already. And um, I remember one person that I was paying attention to saying, you know, don't mint your best stuff, you know, like just test things out, you know, just try <laughs> things out. So, so, so while I was, while this is what I was working on and that, and that I was sharing most with, with people who were paying attention to my work and that I was excited about like making an entire deck out of which I, I still plan on doing um this was like this was like my this was like what I had in my back pocket is like you know this is my thing this is what I'm kind of focused on now and I'm not sure I want to I'm not sure what happens to to it if I mint it uh I'm not sure what, so so I'm gonna try minting other things and I tried minting other things um mostly older work um and there wasn't much interest in those things, to be honest. Um, and it was kind of frustrating and difficult. Um, and I was kind of on this, I was kind of searching for what I could make that people would care about. And I realized that it also was kind of entry into a new community. Like what was happening was that I was trying to take work that had meaning to people who were interested in Caribbean art. Or mm -hmm. uh, we got a freezing problem. Yeah. Um, 
You froze for a minute. Yeah, you just so froze. Photography context. Oh, that you're back. Before the, and I had to ask a question. Oh, oh, okay. Um, I was saying that um, when I started minting, I was minting kind of older wigs, and um, I feel like one issue was that those wigs had meaning or value to people that I met in or communities that I was right. a part of in other contexts. And being part of this new community, um, one challenge was kind of finding work that resonated with with these people and and who were these people and who am I as part of these people and um, and so. Um, yeah, th that was kind of challenging at first. Um, but one thing I was interested in was kind of framing these plants um, mm. in, in, I had made, I had actually made, um, when I made the first terrarium, um, it, it had actually sat on my computer as a still image for like two years. And I, mm. I, um, I wasn't sure what to do with it. Um, and I wasn't sure if, I shared it on my Instagram a couple of times and like a couple of people had, were interested in it. One friend of mine was like, what is that? I want to buy that. And yeah. that, that made me feel like, you know, that okay, this is something that has resonance. Because yeah. Because I love it, but I couldn't really find other people that loved it. Yeah. Um, but but I started I started making um I started an, a, animating. I animated it. I just made it really cheap. Mm -hmm. Um so this is it. This is what it looked like for the longest time. Um it was just this this, this render. Mm -hmm. uh, and it felt really delicate. And it felt really precious. Mm. And I was actually thinking of it for the tarot cards. Um, there's a card called the world. And I was wondering what would happen if I used this image as the world card. It felt so much like a little egg of like a little, maybe like egg of the world. And it was this, mm. this concept this of the world yeah. egg. Yeah. 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 And so, um, but um, yeah, I, I, I framed it differently. I, I actually thought of a, a few of the models that I had that I could frame in a similar way and I thought okay I'll start this new project and and I, I'm gonna love it and you know I'm just gonna stick with it and see see if other people like it too mm -hmm. um, um and uh, by the time I got to like the number nine or so um it was also frustrating in the beginning because nobody was really paying attention but around when I got to around number nine um the one thing happened or was it like number seven or something um two artists that are really influential in that space um Nicholas Sassoon and Pixel Fool they both bought terrariums on the same day and oh. publicized it like like tweeted about it and they also right. they also each they also each bought like works that I made using plants on um they actually got together and and jointly bought a work that I had minted on Ethereum that was using my plant models as well so like, there was this one day where the, the audiences of these two artists just became yeah, instantly like aware. Of your network. Yeah, Great. exactly. And um, and 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 from that moment, a, a, ba a base of kind of collectors and terrariums kind of yeah. started forming. And you know that really motivated motivated me to make more of these. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know it, it just made it just really embedded me in the community because now I'm making this thing that mm -hmm. people care about, and I'm I'm really feeling like the kind of steward of this project. And it's what I was looking for, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's such a good way to look at it to a steward of this project. Like, yeah. I love that because it is like they're very intimate. They're very delicate. They're very, again, romantic, like in that sense. But they're, you know, they're a little bit otherworldly. And to kind of feel like you've got a little bit of a part of that by um, yeah. purchasing an NFT, I think, is the kind of allure to minting and creating um kind of consistency with your um portfolio when you're minting yeah, yeah. Like that feeling of collective ownership is really mm -hmm. interesting. collective ownership yeah that is and that connects with your tumblr background mm -hmm. and your history with um internet culture and art um together or art made from internet culture as well mm-hmm mm -hmm. Um, this is one of the few that I, um, this is one of the few that I, um, it's the only one actually, I think where I, where I totally made up the plant. I use the same, um, you know, uh, modifier or, um, the thing that you use to make hair in Blender to make, to mm -hmm. make the shape of this plant. Um, I'm going to try and do the render view so you can, so you can see what it looks like. Yeah. It'd be fun to um, see the PSD file as well. Like just to see where you do your final, uh, GIF. Yeah. Because that's uh, 
you know, that's like the kind of final part of the project, you know, process, right? Yeah. With uh, yeah. ESG. Yeah, so, so, um, so I, I export the frames from Blender. And so I end up with these 180 frames for each terrarium. Oh, 180. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I like 180 because um because when sometimes I sometimes I want to do like polyrhythmic things. Like I want to have the terrarium rotate. And as the terrarium rotates 360 degrees, I want like a little plant or another element in there to rotate twice in that time. Okay. Um, or three times. And then 180 is nice because you can have something that um is divisible by six. Yeah. So it's divisible by nine. So you can have these multiple, like you can have these really like you can make polyrhythms that where the um uh, the number of times one thing rotates yeah. in a, a particular set of frames, um another thing can rotate mm -hmm. not only half that, but maybe a third of that as well. Yeah. So it's, you get a more complex polyrhythm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a song that's in kind of like a waltz rhythm, you know, like yes. a, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's they beautiful. do have a rhythm, a really clear rhythm to them when you mm -hmm. see them all together too. Yeah, and I've done a couple. I'm gonna try and see if I can find which one it is. Um, there were a couple of them that have have elements in them that rotate. So most of them, everything rotates around one axis at the same time for the 180 frames. But a few of them have like extra elements that that rotate on their own. Um, so let me open the file and show you. Oh, is it open already? Really like I think one thing, and maybe it's like our background in photography because I did photography before 3D, and that's how I kind mm. of is like the fact that these are all monochrome and have a kind of grain to them. Yeah. And I, I love that. I'm, I'm like forever fighting with my tendency to like just have, you know, everything be monochrome. Cause I like, and it comes from doing black and white photography, but I love the restrained, like the palette here, the tones it's, yeah, there's a real minimalism to it. That's really elegant. Thank you. Really yeah, I, I, I was really, really attached to it as well. Um, there's an, a second vision of this, these terrariums that, I, that I'm doing now and, and purely for the sake of variation and to, to challenge myself, I'm, I'm using color. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but for a long time, I was just totally obsessed with this and, and, and really uncompromising, unwilling to, 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 to stray from it because I felt like I needed um, my full attention and engagement to, to kind of get everything I could get out of it because mm -hmm. I thought that color could be distracting because what 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 felt really precious here was that um, the glass material um, you could change the roughness of it and you would see through it um, different you, you it would it would make um, your ability to see what's inside of it um, yeah. more or less yeah and so yeah. sometimes it could look kind of cloudy kind of like frosted glass and it looks more like resin than glass sometimes it looks more like um, a really thick plastic. Yeah. And I felt like the focus on that was what I really wanted to um, yeah. kind of base this exploration yeah. on. And so, so it, it did like become all about the tones. Yeah. Yes. I use glass shaders so much, like almost all of my yeah. use a glass shader. And it's, but I think what, you know, the reason it almost like comes back to the reason that I wanted to learn 3D in the first place because I was doing this architectural photography. Beautiful. Street scene. Yeah, these are lovely. And it was that question of like, well, if you have a 3D model, you can make it translucent and then you can see what's inside. And that's not something yes. you can do in the real world. It yes. actually, it shows, I was just writing about this for my feral file statement. It like reveals the structure of the image, you know, like you actually yeah. see the model. Yeah. It's almost like that wireframe. So yeah, yes. I think, like, right. I think that's something we have in common with our aesthetic is like that, that interest in sort of what is, what is revealed, what is concealed, and how can 3D like uniquely do that in a way that no other medium can? Yeah, for that reason, I, I have so many screenshots of just the wireframes. Yeah. And I've tried, I've tried just taking those screenshots and animating the wireframe, like because the thing about 3D is that there, there are a few things about it that are just like the fact that you can do things in in virtual 3D that you can't do in real life. Yeah. Um, and, you, and, and that you experience these things when you're making the objects. When it comes time for you to show it and you kind of, um, you're, not, you're not in that, you're not showing that anymore. You're not working with that anymore. You're just showing what's we, final. You feel like something is lost. Yes. No, we talk about this so much. Like 
And it was for me like showing work online and showing work in browser. Actually, yeah. and I had like a show in Mozilla Hubs, you could fly around, you could rotate the models and play with them. And for me, that was like closer to the experience that I have when I'm making it. Because yeah. you're exactly right. You 3D print it, you stick it in a gallery, you know, something's gained, it becomes something else, but it's it's removed from that experience that we have with the files. And that's yeah. almost another reason we wanted to have this channel because like that process, that craft that goes in behind it is really fascinating, I think, to, you know, to me and Colette. And so to see there's like a lightness, there's a sort of playfulness, there's an interactivity and being able to see inside a model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, um, you mentioned like being able in Mozilla Hub to fly around and objects. I remember when I started making 3D models, I started dreaming um, in that same 3D space where there's no like up or down, but you just yeah. see the object and the orientation around it. And I was, I remember thinking, uh, oh. I think my brain is being up, upgraded right now. Just yeah. From my <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yes. love that. It's different. Yeah, it's very hard to convey to people who don't work in 3D. I think that I wonder if gaming now has brought a lot more people into Definitely. I do think that. gaming and like where things are going with um, DALI and, you know, OpenAI and I think Mid Journey is another one where people are starting to kind of have more of a hand in manipulating the images or imagery they're using that maybe even could connect with games. There's definitely more of a connection to 3D amongst people who aren't necessarily artists as well. Mm -hmm. But I think it's even more important for artists to get creative in these tools as they're evolving and as the technology is evolving um, to really play with it. Um, oh, those are also beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Um, Thanks. I'm looking for the one that has the other things. I can show you the polarism thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, you were one of the first um, art artworks that I saw in Tez because I minted in August 2021. That was my first mint. And so I kind of got in there and I had to and Aria was showing me the ropes as well. Um, and I remember seeing your work. I think it was in her collection because mm -hmm. I was learning how to navigate the world of Hicket Nuke and like, yeah. you know, kind of, and I just remember just being mesmerized by them. And that was so lovely that like pausing within the kind of chaos of like the amount of NFTs there are oh, um, yeah. in the space That's of so Hicket Nuke awesome. to like have something that could slow you down just a minute, mm -hmm. but still play with the attention span of that space. And I think that's really clever in that sense because, you know, it, it kind of talks, it goes back to that intimacy and that, you know, um, kind of tactile connection you were talking about earlier. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, it yeah. is nice to have something that is, you know, at slower paced and not as much as I appreciate some of that work, like there's a real visual onslaught to some of that you know because it's the internet and you're trying to grab people's attention and you don't have much time with anybody so yeah I really really appreciate the the pace of these oh, yeah that's so, so fun to see the wireframe yeah. as well so as we're kind of getting towards the end of the episode I'd love mm -hmm. to hear kind of like ideas of like where you want to take this and where you're taking your work mm. Well, um, so there's, um, so, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll share two things, um, and I'll, I'll try not to spend too much time. So the first one I want to show you is, um, this is kind of what I, what I did after the terrariums. Actually, I should show you, I should show you. This. We love okay, seeing the one. actual files on file exchange. This is okay. very perfect. Yeah, somebody else's hard <laughs> drive, that's always yeah, like. Yeah, that's like. <laughs> love seeing folders within folders on file exchange yeah 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 or so like this, this is like very final five you know like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that yeah I'm trying to break myself of that habit but it's, uh, it's, a hard, it's hard to do it's hard to do because like how do you so hard <laughs> I started using v1 and v2 all the time oh yeah before. yeah but then I started to be descriptive so I know what the difference is between them when I'm looking at files. I know Okay, so this is um this is a project called the Veil, and it's what I it's what I did right after the terrarium. I was trying to figure out like how could I I started so because of the terrarium I started playing so much with the glass and um and make and thinking of the glasses 
thinking of the glass vessels as lenses. And mm-hmm. so I was like, well, what if I made a lens that um, instead of rotating around it, it had its own undulation. And what I would do is, um, is rotate the lens and put objects beneath the lenses and then look through the lens. So um, oh. that's what I was doing with this project, which is called The Veil. And it, I only made four of them because when I made the fourth one, I was like, okay, I think I did what I wanted to do. I'm not, I'm not gonna like, force myself to repeat this a mm. um, hundred times or whatever. But so let me show you, let me show you the gift. Um, yeah. Should be in here. Beautiful. I love that idea of doubling because you've already got an imagination <laughs> and then there's a sort of second layer to it. Well, it's also like taking it out of the vessel and putting yeah, it more yeah. into a observing or magnifying glass kind of, yeah, you know, insinuation, like it's a specimen now, it's out of yeah. the vessel. Yeah. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Love that. Yeah. And- it, it felt like, it felt like, it, like referring to the act of looking, like it felt like, I don't know, I just wanted to bring everybody in on it. And I really thought that this would, I really thought that, you know, when I put this out, like nobody's going to want terms anymore. Everybody's going to be into this because of how I felt about it. And I'm sorry that I didn't want to make terms anymore, but I was really excited about this. But um, I'm not sure for whatever reason. Also, also this could have happened after Picket Link had kind of like collapsed. And people had kind of splintered into all these different spaces and I'm into these on Vusum. So I don't know, it never got so the sort of traction that the other project got, but I really love these. So um, so I'm excited to show you. And so this is what's beneath the lens. It's just this right. model of a, of a plant that um, grows in my house. Yeah. Um, a pot of a vine. Mm-hmm. Um, Pothos. Yes, it's a pothos. Pothos. Yeah, yeah, it's actually right behind. Yeah, here it is. I see yeah. it. Oh my god, that's so yeah. much stuff. <laughs> yeah, we've gotten to yeah. it's meta. Um, that is, yeah, I, I love that. You know, we're also so mitigated by screens in so many ways, or kind of opened up by screens. They're like portals as well. So depending on how you look at it. So to have like that as like an organic kind of undulating almost mm-hmm. um it looks like also like the the retina or you know uh, the iris. Uh, yes. The eye. Yes. Yeah, and this. Oh, one... I'm pick. I'm picking up the cards you're putting down. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm so happy you are because I was so I'm, I'm I was I was just totally knitting out on this and I just thought, you know, I just love it so much. I, I can't get enough of it. So, um, so I did this. Um, I found people were so interested in it, even though I loved it. But then I was like, but wait, what if instead of using plant these models of plants like I've been using which will actually take me a long time to make and so if I want to make if I want to explore this um I need to do something that doesn't take as much time um I was thinking of using archives um archival images which are lots of artworks that already exist so then um I did this project which is called um call it um heirloom collection so I'm thinking of I'm thinking of all of these works that exist in the public domain as kind of like heirlooms like images that we inherit like they're all ours to use Mm -hmm. and often you know I you know if I'm if I'm just scrolling through my Twitter I spend so much time looking at new images just looking at things that people made today or this during this week um yeah but what about what about all of the um you know the, the millions of images that people have made over you know, the hundreds of years that we've been recording images. And I, and I think about that wealth of imagery and I, and I want to, I wanna, I, you know, I'm thinking there must be something in there that, that I care about. And I'm, I'm going to look through these archives and like find things that I like, and I'm going to put them onto these lenses. And I'm going to take this whole, this whole practice of looking and, 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 and looking at things in a different, like literally seeing them differently because of yeah. putting them on, under a different lens. And yeah. I'm going to play with all of that. So um, that was the idea behind um, uh, the heirloom collection. But, um, not that many people seem to be into it, even though I'm so excited about it. Um, so I'll show you a couple of my favorites. My favorite one, and the one I think has been most successful, is this one. Um, so, so while it loads, I can show you the GIF. Nice. I mean, the level of work and layers in your work is just, this is so, for me, this is so uh, rewarding to see, like, all of these different components of it, because I think, you know, Mm -hmm. you make it look effortless, like what you're putting out there. And I think most like a beautiful piece of art always kind of looks effortless, but the amount of research and time that goes into these, 
Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, I love this. Oh, I love this too. This is so beautiful. Thank you. I, I love it too. I'm so, I, 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 I just put this on. I love these. Watching. Yes. Hypnotic. I just want to kind of sit and watch it. Just. And this oh. is from a, so I call it 200 year old mythical bead. The illustration was made by an artist. So in, every time I mint it, I put all the information I can find from the original artist in the description. So it's all there in the metadata. Yeah. And so this was made by an artist um, whose name I don't remember right now, but it's, it's on there um, 200 years ago. But the type of bead that he lists it as, when I Google it, I, can, I can't find a blue vision of that bead anyway. I think he changed the color of the bead in his illustration. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's like this mythical bit. It, it doesn't. It doesn't actually exist, even though it's like a scientific drawing of, of it. And then, mm. and then for me, this is like one of the, maybe the most successful um, instance of this project because it, the the way that it warps a bit, it it looks like so many different types of bit. It it changes form so dramatically yeah. at different times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's it's it's interesting that that's. I sort of think about this a lot with digital work where you're you're introducing an element that's unpredictable, you know, and for me, that's a scanner. For somebody else, it might be kind of a line of code or, you know, like I'm not a generative artist, but there's an element that you bring in that you don't control. And then there's sometimes the results are surprising, you know, where yeah. the magic can happen in that place. That's why... Ages ago, when I had a project where I was using Rorschach ink blots, I made the Rorschach mm. ink blots because it was so fun to see what the ink would do depending on the different variables and like, yeah. how, you know, what what kind of shapes would come out of it. And I think I love that idea of that unpredictable and uncontrollable kind yeah. of collaborative element, which I think is where yeah. open a, you know, yeah. Dali is starting to kind of and like the idea of having AI generated images is starting to kind of enter in. And I think this piece talks about that in a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have a, I have a, I have a, um, I have a collection of those on um, Fusum and I'll, I'll put the mm -hmm. link so you can see, oh, yeah. so you can see the others. And okay. then I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you the last thing I'm gonna show you. Episode comments for sure. All right, yeah. excellent. Um, the last thing I'll show you is the new terms I'm making. So the challenge here is to kind of use color um, and also, you know, I wanted to make, um, I wanted to make the project relate more to the real world. I mm -hmm. wanted, so I felt like, you know, I'm, I often when I collect images, when I take pictures of plants to model, um, it's cause I've gone to a new place and I'm kind of fascinated by the nature there. And, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it feels a lot like I'm taking and harvesting and using a lot from the real and I, and, and, you know, for, for whatever, for, you know, for all the reasons that exist now, I'm thinking a lot about how nature is kind of just, how we're just decimating it with like all the things we do every day and how even small actions, when you think about what makes them possible, is just this kind of culture of, um, it's a kind of disrespectful culture, which, you know, I don't want to get too into because it's so heavy, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I want to, because all this work refers to these, um, to nature and uses nature mm -hmm. um and it's become a significant um part of my life um i wanted to figure out how it could put something back so mm -hmm. what i'm what i'm doing now is with so i stopped the last the first terrarium series i kept it at 30 mm -hmm. and so i'm gonna i'm gonna do this next set i've, I've done three already it's gonna be 30 also mm -hmm. um i'll show you the gift for the first one and mm -hmm. Yeah, what um, what I I've what I'm here doing first. <laughs> is um, every time we sell uh, sell out an edition, I'm gonna take ten percent of the uh, proceeds from the sales and put them into some kind of environmental preservation yeah. effort. Yeah, so that's amazing. After this first one, um, ten percent of it um went to um. A company called One Tree Planted, and they plant trees all over the world. And for every dollar you donate, they plant one tree. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're able to plant or contribute to the planting of seventy trees in um, wow. in the High Andes, which is where the plant that's in this terrarium oh, originates. Oh, I love that! Yeah, that's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. that's a such a delicious. good way to use also like NFTs and like you know that kind of mm -hmm. crowdfunding almost it's another yeah. type of yeah. you know you know your collectors become 
they're your community, but they're also funding your projects and like um, to use that and a percentage of that um, for something that relates with the concept of the piece is really um, conceptually interesting as well. And I think a good model for other artists out there, you know, wanting to do something and not quite knowing how. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um. I don't know, this is the file. Time, just a heads up. We've got it. Oh quickly. yeah, we're starting to. Okay, so this is a good one to kind of yes. end on. This is beautiful. Oh wow. Oh, it's so fun to see the files. I, I know. This has, been, <laughs> this has been epic. Oh. Oh, that is so beautiful, and I love the subtlety of the color. I'm also someone who kind of kind of had an achromatic palette and then is getting mm -hmm. back into color and like bringing that into the work and it's, it's, it's uh it's color is yeah and it's got such a sensory response and a historical you know association yeah. symbolism and so it is a heavy it feels like yeah. a heavy like tool a lot of decision. in your work yeah yeah right. but yeah this is, um this 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 is reminding me a lot of um in, like photography which is kind of where I started because it because I, I'm using lights to um to make the to make the colors because it's glass like if you put colored lights around then it just colors the glass so this one is really simple with just these two these two lights and um and this one is yellow and then this one is um this kind of pinkish color and then the background is a gradient in the background mm -hmm. and then the material of the um of the plant is um it's translucent as well. So there's some, you get some complex refraction and stuff, reflection yeah. going on in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. You've got some nice uh, naming habits on your files. Just want to, I just want to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Um, oh, no, well, I mean, I just, I think that's a beautiful spot to wrap up the episode. I just, we are, just thrilled about this. I think everybody's going to get so much out of this episode for seeing all the different layers to your files. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Rodell. And thanks for uh, having me. We'll, this was really fun, and I'm so and happy we'll, I got to meet y'all. Yeah, well, yes, us too. And then we will include links of all the things you've mentioned in yeah. the description. Uh, for this video. And also, I just want to remind anybody, if they like this channel, please like and subscribe. It helps the algorithm. Um, and we, and also let us know in the comments if you have any suggestions for guests. We're always open to that as well. And yeah, we'll see you next time. And thank you so much uh, again, Riddell. Thank you.